Good afternoon, and thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Juan Bonifacino, and I was given the special honor of introducing today's speaker, Eric Betzig, uh, who will deliver the uh, Wednesday afternoon lecture on the secret lives of cells. Uh, Eric is a professor of molecular and cell biology and uh, Eugene Cummins presidential chair in experimental physics and HHMI investigator at the University of California, uh, Berkeley. And he is a winner of the 2014 Nobel Prize in Chemistry together with Stefan Hell and William Morner for the development of super resolution uh, microscopy. Um, Eric obtained his uh, PhD degree in applied and engineering physics from Cornell University in 1988. And uh, the uh, concept of super resolution uh, was already found in Eric's PhD thesis, uh, which involved the development of near field uh, optical microscopy, uh, which was an early form of super resolution. And as shown here in Eric's first paper published in 1986, in, in the Biophysical Journal. Uh, he uh, subsequently uh, uh, worked at the AT&T Bell Labs and in the machine, machine tool industry in the, in the private sector. And it was during this period that he developed a conceptual framework uh, for um, point localization microscopy. Uh, as published in this other paper in uh, Optical Letters, in 1995. Uh, in this paper, he postulated that fluorescent particles could be resolved at the nanometer uh, scale, that is super resolved, uh, if they could be individually isolated on the basis of some unique optical property. Now, the nature of that unique optical property uh, at the time was not, in, was not obvious, was not immediately obvious. Uh, but many years later, uh, Eric had a eureka moment uh, when he read uh, in Science Magazine uh, this article by George Patterson and Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz uh, uh, here at NIH uh, on the, uh, describing the development of uh, photoactivatable uh, green fluorescent protein. So uh, Eric contacted uh, Jennifer, and I will not describe the details of how that happened. Uh, but uh, he ended up coming uh, to NIH uh, in October uh, 2005 and to work in a small dark room in Building 32, and I think many of you probably don't even know where that building is, and uh, where, together with his longtime collaborator, uh, Harald Hess, uh, they completed the assembly of the first uh, photoactivated localization microscope uh, or, uh, uh, or PALM. And obtain, so this, this is a picture of that first uh, uh, super resolution rig that they assembled in Building 32, and with which they obtained the first really astounding views of the cell in, with unprecedented uh, resolution. And this is an example of the endoplasmic reticulum uh, uh, image by uh, Palm. Uh, these results were published in this landmark paper uh, in uh, 2006, and the rest is history. Um, since then, um, uh, Eric moved to uh, the HHMI, Janilia Research Campus, where he has continued to revolutionize the field of uh, microscopic imaging by developing uh, other uh, imaging modalities such as uh, lattice light sheet, uh, microscopy, and adaptive optics, which are being used in labs, uh, in many, many labs around the world. So without further ado, I uh, would like to invite Eric to the podium, and I also would like to ask you to join me in welcoming Eric back to NIH. Thank you very much, Juan. It's good to be back. I haven't been NH for a while, but 
brings back very fond memories. And thank you all for coming today. So um, the optical microscope has been around for 400 years now. And for 300 of those years, it was really the dominant tool by which we studied living systems below the level of the naked eye. But at the end of the 19th century, Carl Zeiss and Ernst Abbe teamed up to try to make microscopy a science instead of an art. And they found a way to, to reproducibly make microscopes and found furthermore that there was a limit to how small that you could see, which was about half the wavelength of light. But because now it was something that they could produce routinely at that level, the microscope, because it had hit that limit, kind of stalled. And as a result, there really wasn't fundamentally much difference between the microscope you could buy in 1980 and the microscope you could buy in 1880. Certainly detectors got better, cameras got better, light, light sources got better, but the microscope was fundamentally the same. So as a result of that stagnation of the microscope, to, see, to understand better the cell, biologists created a number of other tools, such as biochemistry, to break apart cells and see how their components interact, molecular biology to get the genetic blueprint, and structural biology through things like uh, X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, regular EM, to understand the structure of the cell. The problem of these tools, though, is although they've been incredibly powerful, so powerful that they're the dominant paradigms by which many biologists understand the cell, the problem is that they're all quite reductionist. And they're all essentially taking the cell down to its screws and trying to understand it that way. But if I want to understand any dynamic system, like, say, an internal combustion engine, I contend that breaking it down the screws will be fruitless in getting a full understanding, because you won't understand how combustion is happening, how the spark plugs play a role, how the valve timing works, and so forth. You have to be able to see the system in its entirety, and you have to be able to see the dynamics. That's certainly true of biology, because the thing that defines life is that it's animate. And the fact that it's animate means that it's moving. And so that if we can't see it in its moving state, we're always going to be defeated from getting a full understanding. Now, the problem is, is that the only really good tool to look at high resolution at moving living systems without perturbing them is the optical microscope. So how can we build a better microscope? Well, a lot of things came together by chance at about the time I entered grad school to provide new opportunities. First was cheap PCs that you could use to control your microscopes, and furthermore, take digital images that you could then analyze. You also had sensors that were single photon sensitive, so you didn't have to throw as much light at the specimen. You had first immunofluorescence techniques so that now cells weren't just sort of phase contrast images of ghostly bags that were lumpy, but instead you could highlight any one or several of the 10,000 different types of proteins in them. And then in the 90s, you had fluorescent proteins, so you could do this in living cells. And then finally, you had lasers, which were cheap enough at that point to put into microscopes to either precisely illuminate fluorophores, or phys physicists could use the lasers, because it was coherent light, to do different tricks in how you shape the beams in space and time to make different types of microscopes. So really, since the late 1980s, there's been a Cambrian explosion of new microscope technologies that have appeared that are really nothing more than mixing these different components in different ways to serve different needs of biologists. So as Juan pointed out, I was lucky enough to get in on that in the very early days, in the early 80s. But the technology that I'm probably best well known for is the one for which NIH played a big role. And as Juan pointed it out, the key was photoactivation, that if I have a cell with a photoactivated fluorescent protein, if I initially shine light on it, I can't see it at all. But if I use violet light, I can activate the fluorophores, and then I can shine blue light on it, and it'll fluoresce green. So that was developed by Jennifer and George Patterson here at NIH. Um, when my buddy Harold Hess and I heard about that, um, we realized that this idea that I pitched earlier that Juan described would be achievable by if that's the green fluorescent protein, then this fuzzy blob is what you see in a normal microscope. 
but you can point to the center of that fuzzy blob with much precision, better precision than the diameter of the blob. The problem is that in a normal sample, the molecules are so close together that the blobs overlap and you don't see anything. But if you can turn that purple photoactivating light down very low, then only a few molecules are turned on at a time. They're likely separated by much more than the diameter of the fuzzy blob, so you can find their centers accurately. You turn that subset of molecules off, turn on another subset, and on and on you go until eventually you go from the diffraction limited image to the super resolution image. So when Harold and I heard about PAGFP, it struck us that this was obvious and simple, and why the hell hasn't anybody done this before? So we were very excited, but terrified at the same time of being scooped. We had one problem in that at that time, we were both unemployed. And so it was gonna take far too long to write a grant or get VC funding. So we said, screw it. And the good news is Harold is much smarter than I am because when I left Bell, I told them all to go to hell. But when he left Bell, he was able to take all of his equipment with him. <laughs> so uh, we were able to pull that out of the storage sh shed, put about 50K each of our own money in it. And normally, if you're in California, do this kind of thing in a garage. But Harold wasn't married, so we could do it in the living room because it was far more comfortable there. And so after three months, we had a microscope built. The problem is, is we were two physicists who knew zero biology, but I was scheduled to give a talk here at NIH about another microscope idea I had, and I begged them to invite Jennifer and George to the talk. I took them to lunch, swore them to secrecy, said we have this nutty idea, Jennifer said, fantastic, bring it by. I didn't realize then that Jennifer says fantastic to everything and everybody. <laughs> but uh, we took that as a yes. And so uh, then we shipped the microscope here. And then in, with George's help in just a couple months, this is a 70 nanometer cryosection through a cell looking at multivesicular bodies at the diffraction limit. And then with palm or photoactivated localization microscopy. And if you zoom in, you can better appreciate the resolution you can get. So this took off immediately because it's simple enough to do in your living room, and pretty soon everybody was doing this kind of thing, and the rest, as Juan said, is history. So um, at this, the same time, Harold and I got lucky enough to get hired by Howard Hughes Medical Institute for their new Janelia campus, and we did a bunch of applications. In one case with a group at Berkeley, we were able to show that the chemotaxis receptors and E. coli form different aggregates of different sizes and locations along the axis. And that organization is predictable in terms of a stochastic model of self-assembly that doesn't require any active transport. Uh, my very first postdoc, Hari, who is now head of a group here at NIH and NIBIB, um, we looked at focal adhesion proteins and showed that proteins that look co-localized at the diffraction limit are actually form little nano aggregates inside of these adhesions. There was a group at EMBL who took POM to an ultimate level by using the same particle averaging trips, tricks that you use in cryo EM to take many, many Im POM images and distill that into one angstrom precision of the location of different um, subunits inside of the nuclear pore and resolve an ambiguity that happens in the EM reconstruction to show the orientation of those subunits. Harold built the ultimate palm microscope at Janelia that gets even higher resolution axially than laterally by interfering the light from every floor four with itself. And with Claire Waterman here at NIH, built up this model of the focal adhesions from the extracellular matrix to the cytoskeleton. And with Jennifer, um, he also worked to look at the escort protein, which is involved in the scission of HIV viruses, and show that the, the protein actually invades the virus itself rather than staying as a scroll on the inner part of the plasma membrane just prior to the, the splitting off. So all that's kind of success stories. There's many, many problems with super resolution, and my history is one of getting dissatisfied over and over and over again, you'll say with the talk, so one of my sources of dissatisfaction with super resolution was almost everybody who's been doing it has been doing it on f chemically fixed cells. And the EM community has known for years that chemical fixation changes ultrastructure. So you go, instead of having beautiful mitochondria and ER like this, you have ex 
expanded mitochondria, you blow out the cristae, the chromatin is all messed up. There's a huge number of papers coming out now on chromatin archi architecture by super resolution on chemically fixed cells. And I just shake my head and wonder that these things are happening. Um, so in order to get around that, Harold and I at Janelia have developed a pipeline for high pressure freezing of cells, doing actually down at liquid helium temperatures, super resolution uh, palm and structured illumination microscopy of those cells. And then while cold, doing freeze substitution um, and then putting it in a focused ion beam scanning electron microscope, which is really fantastic that Harold has developed. He's developed this thing to actually image entire fly brains at four nanometer isotropic voxels. So cells are really no challenge for it. And we've developed a platform to correlate. And what you immediately find is a bunch of surprises. So for example, a vesicle smack dab in the middle of the nucleus that has an ER marker or by using two different labels of transcriptionally active or inactive chromatin to show that you have transcriptionally active heterochromatin and transcriptionally inactive euchromatin inside of the nucleus. So basically this becomes a tremendous hypothesis generator and a lot of what we know by EM is basically a bit biased by what we've seen over 50 years and having that fluorescence on top of it even if it's just moderate level of fluorescence like SIM, creates a bunch of surprises about where proteins are actually being localized inside of the cell. So all of that's great, but the other source of my dissatisfaction with super resolution is it's usually done, again, fixed cells. And so in 2008, I heard a talk by Scott Frazier, then at Caltech, where he said, if the, if the goal of biology is to understand the rules by which inanimate molecules come together to create the animate cell. It's just, and if you want to understand those rules, and all you have is still pictures, it's as difficult as understanding a football game by seeing a series of still pictures. No matter how high resolution those pictures are, you see the quarterback going back to throw a pass, you see the halfback fumbling the ball, you see the cheerleaders making a pyramid on the sideline, and it's damn hard to see how these things are related. But if you can actually see the movie of what's going on or watch the game in person, the rules become obvious. And when I heard that talk while I was dissatisfied with Palm in 2008, I said, damn it, I've looked at dead stuff my entire life. I'm not going to do this anymore. I want to do live imaging. So <clears throat> you can do live imaging with Palm. And that's something that we developed with Jennifer um, called SPT Palm where instead of trying to photoactivate every molecule and create a structure of what's going on, you photoactivate subsets of molecules and watch their diffusion or their aggregation and then turn on other subsets to look at that. So at left, you're looking at two different proteins, one which is fairly immobile in the plasma membrane and one which is quite mobile. At right, you're seeing a modern example of this technology by my colleague James Lew at Genelia, where those two circles are the nuclei of two cells the left one wild type, the right one with the mutant, which creates Huntington's disease. Um, and on the left one, you can see that even the wild type cell creates little aggregates, but they're much smaller and they're very transient in time. Whereas when you have this glutamine repeat, it makes the protein much stickier with itself and creates these large temporally stable aggregates. Now those have been known about for a long time, but James did a double label experiment where he also looked at a transcription factor, SP1. And that's these little purple fireflies that you see here. And so what he found is that those transcription factors actually get bound up in the aggregates like quicksand. And so they're not able to get to the DNA to produce RNA. And so they downregulate gene expression downstream. So it isn't certain that this is directly the cause of the disease, but it shows the kind of power that live imaging can bring to the table to show things that you would never be able to deduce by something like biochemistry in terms of a possible mechanism for the role of these aggregates. So um, while you can do SPT palm as a tool, it still has a problem in that it require, you're trying to get much information, so you have to photoactivate many times. So basically, there's going to be trade-offs. If you want to have a higher spatial resolution image, it has to have more pixels. If it has more pixels, you're taking more measurements. If you're taking more measurements, it's going to take more time. 
And if it's you're th over that longer period of time, you're still throwing potentially damaging light at the specimen, so it's likely going to be more toxic to the specimen. And furthermore, the higher you try to look in resolution, the more difficult it is to look deep into samples. And so there's always these trade-offs between these different variables. And so when I heard Scott's talk in 2008, I said, well, everybody is working now in super resolution with the gold rush in it to go to this point. I'm going to march in the opposite direction and try to find other areas in this tetrahedron which are poorly served for biologists and create microscopes for that. So the guy who understood these trade-offs long before the rest of us in the community was Mats Gustafsson, who, while he was a postdoc at UCSF, developed a technique called structured illumination microscopy, where you illuminate the sample with a grading pattern, which creates these moiré fringes with the structure in the sample to create lower frequency patterns that you can see in the microscope. So with this technique, you're limited to a gain of only twice beyond the diffraction limit, or about 100 nanometers in resolution. But even though it's only twofold better, the, that weakness is in many ways a strength because you only need to take nine images per plane in order to get the information, so it's much faster, and requires orders of magnitude less intense light than single molecules require. So therefore, it's non-invasive and very fast. So here's the endoplasmic reticulum now. Instead of a few frames, you're looking at it for 1,800 frames at just a little more of a, than a second a frame. And so, yeah, it's, it's 100 nanometers resolution, but look at the wealth of information you have about the dynamics of the endoplasmic reticulum by having much better time resolution than these other methods. So we've used that extensively a lot with many groups at NIH. One of the tricks we did is go to a very specialized objective by my postdoc Dong to take the resolution down to 84 nanometers. Um, and with nonlinear tricks, we've been able to take that down about 62 nanometer resolution in live cells. One of the applications with, with, was with Tommy Kirchhausen's group at Harvard, where we looked at clathrin mediated endocytosis. Because it's in total internal reflection, only this part of the pit is illuminated. So with that added resolution, now the pits are resolved as rings, so you can determine the diameters of these pits. And so you can actually track the formation of a clathrin-coated pit, its maturation and its, and its uh, internalization over time, see a small trend between the size of the pit and the lifetime. Another advantage of structured illumination is you can use any fluorophores. You don't need switchable ones. So it's easy to do multicolor imaging. In this case, we're looking at cortical actin and clathrin-coated pits. And we found that in about half the cases, just prior to endocytosis, actin is recruited to the pit. And it has a small but statistically significant shift in the lifetime of the pit and shortening it. We also found that many of these large plaques of clathrin were just clusters of pits that would occasionally a single pit would spit out of it. We also found very ubiquitously actin rings of about the same size as the rings of the pits. Um, and uh, we thought, well, hey, those must be being used to pinch off the, the pits. But it turns out almost none of them are co-localized with clathrin. And we still don't know what their role is, but they're very common in cortical actin of cells. <clears throat> The problem with this, this turf sim method with that extra resolution, though, is we're only looking about 100 nanometers into the cell. So at the end of his postdoc, Dong developed this method to go just outside of total internal reflection so that the light goes parallel to the cover slip. That's so that you don't have the out-of-focus illumination of the rest of the cell. That's what we call grazing incidence structured illumination but allows us to then probe about a micron deep so we can see more organelles in the peripheral parts of the cell. So, and the advantage of that approach is we've also been able to push the resolution, or push the temporal resolution up to the point where at about 266 frames a second at the fastest. This is a little bit slower in this case where we're looking at uh, microtubules in the endoplasmic reticulum and you can see, again, for example, ER tubules that slide along the microtubules. You can see um, ring arrangements uh, of the ER uh, caused by the microtubules. Um, there's a lot of different mechanisms by which microtubules can change the ER morphology. 
These were already long since published where you either slide along a microtubule or you hang on to the plus end of a growing microtubule to pull out an um, uh, ER tubule. But you can also hang on to the depolymerizing end of a microtubule and pull one out. You can also hang ER off of a lysosome and then have it hitchhike with the lysosome as it's actively transported on the microtubule. And sometimes you actually do get just de novo budding of ER filaments without any microtubule action at all. And these are the relative contributions of those. So Dong also used this to study the interactions between the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria. And what he found is that um, for the uh, um, fission of the mitochondria that are caused uh, throughout the cell, about 84% of the fissioning events he observed were actually mediated by the endoplasmic reticulum and in fact shortened the time for fissioning versus de novo fissioning. Um, he also looked at fusion and found that over half of the fusion events are actually also mediated by the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and sometimes you get fusion that's independent of the ER about half the time as well. <clears throat> so some of the other applications we've done with this sim over the years. The bad news is, is you know, normally Mots would have been the one to do all of this work, but we recruited him to Janelia in, in, uh, in 2008, and then in 2011 he died of a brain tumor. And so I ended up inheriting much of his group, and so I kind of felt like Sim was falling, uh, wasn't getting the attention it deserved relative to the higher resolution methods. And so I wanted to pick that up and show that, it, that, that it's a valuable tool even with the lower resolution. I think we've wildly succeeded at that. In my opinion, of all the super resolution methods, Sim has probably revealed the most biology to date. So one of the examples with John Hammer's group here at NIH is the formation of these bipolar filaments of non-muscle myosin II. Here's a de novo formation where new monomers are recruited with the head groups creating this bipolar thing. But now, whoop, what was this? It look, kind of looked like this thing actually peeled off of that. Eh, there's another one that's peeling off there. And so what um, Jordan Beach and John's group was able to show is that while you can get de novo formation of these bipolar filaments, it's far more common for the existing bipolar filaments to act as a template for new ones to form and then split off. And you can see that in sort of a cascading motion as more and more are created and they create more and more and on and on and on as they go through the cell. Um, also with John's group, we looked at uh, Jercat cells activated against an antigen presenting cover slip and they showed that formin is necessary to create these radial and then bent to these circumferential actin arcs which define the region of the immunological synapse. Um, with Tobias Meyer's group at um, Stanford, we were able to show in the collective migration of epithelial cells, if you looked at the actin cytoskeleton, it looks like it's actually continuous between cells. But what we were able to show is that the lead cells send out trailing fingers of cadherin to which the trailing cells grip, and then they remodel their actin cytoskeleton to these fingers so it just appears as if it pierces the cells, but it doesn't. And with Jennifer, once she was at NIH, we were able to look at the dynamics of the ER in more depth, um, and what we found is that, you know, the textbook picture has in the peripheral ER individual tubules or else sheets we showed that many of these sheet type structures are actually tiny, tiny clusters of tubules that coalesce together or then come back apart over time. So all of that's fine, but we're still largely living in flatland with those techniques, and so it's largely a two-dimensional world, and cells actually work in all four dimensions of space-time, and so we need high resolution in all four of those dimensions. And so after I heard Scott's talk in 2008, before we really got into doing a lot of sim as well, I wanted to see if I could somehow create a microscope for live imaging of cells that would be as transformative in terms of the low toxicity and high temporal resolution as Palm was transformative in terms of spatial resolution. And there was definitely an opportunity there because the confocal and the wide field microscope leave a lot to be desired as a three-dimensional tools, 
because they're usually used in an epi configuration where they illuminate the entire thickness of the specimen, even though only one plane is in focus at a time. So as a result, you get um, bleaching and background from the regions above and below. The background is stripped out in a confocal microscope, but it still doesn't stop you from damaging those other regions and bleaching those other regions. So in my opinion, one of the most important innovations in microscopy in this century is when Ernst Stelzer at the EMBL reintroduced a 100-year-old concept called plane illumination, where in this case, you take a cylindrical lens to create a sheet of light which is coincident with the focal plane, and then look at it from above with your detection objective. So now the regions above and below aren't illuminated at all, so there's no toxicity there, there's no bleaching there. The whole plane is illuminated simultaneously. You're not scanning a spot, so you can use a fast camera, snap an image, and then move the sheet up to the next vertical plane in the specimen and quickly develop a three-dimensional view of the dynamics. So this has been a great tool for studying embryogenesis at single cell resolution, but it has a problem in that there's a trade-off between how big of a field of view that light sheet can cover and how thick the light sheet has to be to the point where typically it's really a tool to look at embryogenesis with single cell resolution. And so for me, I wanted to create a tool that would allow us to look with subcellular resolution well, at the same time, when I was unemployed before the Palm, and the reason I actually came to NIH originally to give a talk before I met Jennifer and George was to talk about another microscope that uses a trick called optical lattices, which are used to cool atoms near absolute zero to make a multifocal excitation field. Well, we, I took that idea and used it to create a multifocal ray of lines that we call the lattice light sheet that creates an extremely thin, like four tenths of a micron thick light sheet that we can sweep through the specimen very quickly and then develop a subcellular uh, movie of the dynamics. So here are some examples with that lattice light sheet microscope. And you know, I'm proud and happy to have won the Nobel Prize for Palm, but I know now working with 80 different groups over the years in my own lab and another 80 odd groups through our um, advanced imaging center, Janili on the lattice, that I will never make a microscope as impactful as the lattice light sheet. Um, everybody, I've never felt more like Galileo than I have with this microscope, because almost everybody who comes, who's been looking at the same system for 20 years, sees it in a way they haven't seen it before, like Dictostelia, you know, our collaborators come and they see this little lightning bolt that you see through there, and they look at us and they say, what was that? And we say, you're the biologist, you tell us. We don't know. You know. And it's been like that with everything. Everybody goes away with at least 10 terabytes of data and a big smile on their face, and then they call us up a month later crying because they have no idea what to do with 10 terabytes of data. <laughs> and so <clears throat> that's really the Achilles heel of this microscope that in my new chapter at Berkeley, I'm dedicated to helping to solve, and I'll explain that at the end of the talk. So one of the things that, that um, Lattice has been good for is, again, back to single molecule imaging, because again, most sing and normally this is a spheroid of mouse embryonic stem cells, and if you look with normal wide field illumination, the out of focus makes it impossible to see the in focus molecules. But if you park the Lattice light sheet, our collaborator, Tommy Kierkhausen, calls it 3D turf because you can basically park that light sheet and because only the stuff in the focal plane is illuminated, you get great SNR. That actually turned out to completely upend our ideas about how transcription works because initially, you know, uh, our transcription imaging consortium at Janili had built up this whole picture of a stable trans, uh, transcription initiation complex which rides along the DNA and outspools RNA. And what they found is that the individual transcription factors in that complex only bind to the DNA for a few seconds, whereas they used to think it would be minutes or hours to get the rates of RNA production that they were getting. And so what is the mystery there? And eventually what they found is that what happens is that each different type of transcription factor is there at the cognate site 
in many copies, and they're very loosely held together by intrinsically distorted regions. And when one pops off, there's already many others that are already poised to take the place. So there's this constant stochastic turnover of these guys on the RNA to make that work. So it's a whole completely different stochastic picture of the way this process happens and the more deterministic picture they had. And I think the SIM imaging and the SPT palm imaging, if there's one way I would describe the cell nowadays, in my understanding it as a physicist, is it's a highly stochastic system. It is, there are so many things that are happening, some of it directed by, even the act of transport at some level is stochastic in terms of ATP and so forth in order to make that work. But more generally, many, many things are, and the smaller you look, the more stochastic it is. And so uh, the dynamics is an incredibly important part of being able to understand how the cell works. So some of the applications we've done with Lattice, with a group from Japan, we looked at um, EB1 comets at the ends of growing microtubules in several hundred different cells through all phases of mitosis. And by looking at the trajectories of the tracks, we were able to determine that there actually is de novo formation of new microtubules in metaphase at the metaphase plate, and they don't all have to come from the centrosomes. With Tommy's group, again, we looked at clathrin, but now we looked at clathrin across the entire cell, and we're able to show that in migrating cells where you have this treadmilling lamellipodium on the ventral surface, you still have endocytosis, but on the dorsal surface, endocytosis is shut down in that region. And Tommy hypothesizes that if exocytosis is still balanced on the top and the bottom there, then what happens is there's a net deposition of new membrane at the edge, which is the source of the tre treadmilling lamellum there. But behind that, endocytosis goes into overdrive, and that then sucks in that extra membrane as the cell goes along. With uh, both Jennifer and also Jillian Griffith's group at Cambridge, we looked at primary T cells and their inter interactions with antigen presenting cells and looked away from the synapse but along the side where we identified a very fast flow of actin moving away from the synapse along the sides of these cells. Again, with Tommy's group, we, they built a lattice light sheet of microscope of their own to look at clathrin independent endocytosis of Shiga toxin and calibrated their microscope for single molecule sensitivity. And they were able to show that while there are more events of clathrin independent ingestion of Shiga toxin, the cargos were so much bigger through the clathrin mechanism that still about 85% of, of the total amount was coming through the clathrin coated pits. Uh, we helped Max Crummel at UCSF build his own lattice microscope where he looked at the initial stages of the formation of the immunological synapse and was able to show that the T cell as it's starting to sense the antigen presenting cell sends out lots of microvilli which actually sense about 90, 98% of the surface of the antigen presenting cell. And with Jennifer, once we recruited her to Genelia, we did this experiment where we did six color labeling of different organelles inside of the cell. And again, similar to what we later showed with the uh, grazing incident sim, found that organelle-organelle contacts are ubiquitous throughout the cell, particularly ER mitocontacts. And furthermore, the ER mitocontacts often act as a recruitment site for docking of things like lysosomes for a period of time before they go away. So it's a very interconnected system, the whole organelle system. So being the half glass, half glass empty guy, glass half empty guy that I am, and the pessimist, I was dissatisfied with the lattice despite its successes because I had soaked up enough biology to believe that phenotypes are the result of gene expression, and gene expression is geared, governed in part by the local environment. So if we're looking at immortalized cells on the cover slip, which is far from a natural environment, how can we trust the phenotypes we see no matter how good our microscope is? And so we have to put the cell back into the organism it evolved in order to really understand it. The problem with that is, is that from an optics per guy's perspective, most multicellular systems are like a bag of marbles and like tr 
trying to do un, look through a bag of marbles because of their different refractive indices. And so while we've used lattice light sheet multicellular systems like dorsal closure in Drosophila or the migration of uh, uh, neural stem crest cells that differentiate and go into the olfactory epithelium, I think you'll agree that the resolution that we're getting here is not as good as we were having in the previous examples I showed. And so we need to address this problem to do the multicellular imaging. So that's what I'm saying, the bag of marbles. There's a zebrafish embryo just in a wide field image. It's like the water on your windshield, and so we have to take care of that. So how are we going to do that? Well, there are two different paths to take, and I give a talk about once a year about the historical connections between astronomy and microscopy. And the take-home message of that talk is that microscopists are the retarded stepchildren of astronomers because we steal everything from them 50 years after they develop it first. So here is going to be two more examples. So one way that, that microscopists face the same problem of aberrations from the atmosphere. And so an eight inch telescope in your backyard, if you don't do anything about it, won't have, will have about the same resolution as the biggest telescope on Earth if the conditions aren't better. So the first thing that they do is, if that's the Hale telescope, you put your telescope out in space, and then there's no more atmosphere. So even though the Hubble telescope has half the size of the mirror of the Hale and should have half the resolution, that's what the Crab Nebula looks like under the, under the Hubble versus the Hale. And so getting rid of aberrations is a good path to go. Well, microscopists and, and biologists and chemists have been working for the last decade, particularly because of plane illumination, to get rid of aberrations in multicellular systems by a variety of clearing technologies where you chemically treat the tissue to homogenize the refractive index. One of the most interesting clearing technologies is a crazy thing called expansion microscopy where you infuse your, your fixed tissue with the fluorophores with a polymer gel, you uh, cross-link the gel, you chemically link the fluorophores to the gel, you bring in a protease to break up everything else that's biological, and then you go from, from salty to pure water, and the gel expands until it gets to the length of the chains and stops. So this is two images of a fly brain not at different magnifications, at the same magnification, but before and after expansion. So I saw their paper in 2015 in science, and I said, this is complete garbage. I mean, the data looks like crap. I don't believe any of this. And then a couple uh, years later, in early 2016, um, a couple of Ed's postdocs, Sho and Ray, contacted me and said, you know, we're having trouble trying to extend the expansion to thicker specimens because the specimen is bleaching as we try to image into it. And it's taking too long to cover large volumes. And we heard you had this lattice thing that can image fast and doesn't bleach much. Can we come down and try it? And I said, yeah, sure, come down. And I was sure I was going to just rub their faces in it and show them all the artifacts and all of those images. And the first thing we put in was a piece of mouse cortex uh, with uh, thigh one YFP sparse labeling. And we start to see this, and you can see every spine, every spine neck, every axon, no breaks. And you could have knocked me down with a feather. I couldn't believe it. And I said, OK, I owe to you guys to work with you with this. Let's see if we can do something with this. So we worked for a couple of years and looked at a number of systems. One is the advantage of the lattice, again, is that you can just go much faster and you don't bleach, so you can cover very large volumes of tissue. Here we're going from the white matter all the way up to the dura um, in the visual cortex of the mouse. Three different colors, one marker for sparse subset of neurons, one for uh, a, an antibody to the uh, myelin, and one to the nodes of Ranvier. And, um, so we can, because it's sparse and because it's fluorescence, it's easy to trace all of the branches of specific neurons. We work with a company, Neurolacida, who has an automated platform to quantify various spine parameters. So we looked at 1,500 spines in all different layers of the mouse cortex to characterize, for example, spine heads or backbone length or what have you. We also looked at, again, the nodes of Ranvier on the axons 
and showed that they actually increase in spacing with increasing distance from the soma. Um, we looked at the myelin sheath and showed that the myelin sheath is not concentric, but actually changes quite a bit as you go through both in terms of G ratio and its uh, asymmetry with respect to its center with respect to the axon as you go along. Um, we can't look at a whole mouse brain because a lattice microscope chamber is nowhere near big enough, but it turns out that fly brains are just the right size to fit in without any sectioning at all. And it's also helpful that fly brain happens to be by far the most studied thing at Genelia. Um, and they've developed a long pipeline of, of uh, very specific antibodies. So we can, this is now looking across a whole fly brain in two colors. One to look at um, a presynaptic mark or um, a, a synaptic marker NC82, and also another marker to all the dopaminergic neurons. There's about 110 dopaminergic neurons across the brain, and so uh, again we can visualize that at about uh, again 60 by 60 by 90 nanometer resolution, and get all of that data you know in just a couple days. Um, by contrast, although it's much higher resolution in the TEM pipeline we did, it was about six years to do one brain versus the couple days. Um, so um, this is showing, uh, again, that we can look at all the synapses across the brain, compare the synapse sizes by the gold standard that we got from some of the EM data to make sure that we're really seeing synapses and not nonspecific labeling. And we were able to basically show, whereas before from the EM, they've now characterized one part of the mushroom body that's about 1 80th of the volume of the brain um, in five years of effort. In two days, we were able to tell you that there's 40 million, neuron, or 40 million synapses across the fly brain, half a million of which synapse onto the dopaminergic neurons. And they're distributed differently in different neuropil regions. It was known that the highest density of synapses in the mushroom body, but we were also able to show that the antlers have quite a bit, and so they may also be involved in associative learning as well. Um, we were able to also do multiple brains and try to look at stereotypy of neural circuitry, and what we find is that there's significant differences in the number of boutons in various projection neurons to other parts, like in the calyx here, where there's both in terms of number of boutons and their volume varies significantly from animal to animal. So um, that's great, but um, I think I'm on pretty safe ground saying that nobody's going to be doing expansion microscopy on live specimens anytime soon. And so if we want to do live imaging, which is the thrust of this talk, and do it in a multicellular context, we need another trick. And so it's again astronomers who came up with the solution which is something called adaptive optics. So for ground-based telescopes, they shoot a laser into the stratosphere to create a bright artificial guide star, which is near the very dim astronomical object they want to see. And the light from both of those things comes back into the telescope. You strip off the light from the guide star, look at how it's been aberrated by the atmosphere with a sensor. Then you use a computer to change the shape of a mirror to exactly cancel the distortions from the atmosphere, and then sort of a dynamic pair of eyeglasses, you can think of it as. And then you create flat wave fronts, and you go bing from that to that. So you can actually do better than the Hubble Space Telescope in the infrared with bigger mirrors on Earth um, with uh, adaptive optics. So we can do the exact same trick in microscopy, where we use a two-photon microscope to excite fluorescence anywhere we point it where there is fluorescence inside of, say, a zebrafish. And then we take that light and the light from our microscope, change the shape of a mirror. This is looking at this membrane label in the hindbrain of the fish. You can see that not only does the signal go up, because instead of a gnarly focus, you have a nice tight focus, but the resolution goes up as well. So this is applying it here to a confocal microscope with adaptive optics. That's the soma of a neuron about 150 microns deep. The purple haze is the mitochondria. Now we're turning on the adaptive optics. You can see that. Because it's diffraction limited, we can deconvolve it. And now we can see the mito network just as well as if that were a cell on a cover slip instead of buried 150 microns deep. Here we're using it with a two-photon microscope to look deep into the midbrain of the fish, 
The adaptive optics is on now. Now we're going to turn it off. So if you have a regular two-photon microscope, that's what you would normally see. But now with the adaptive optics, now you get back to the diffraction limit by applying that. So, but you heard me earlier in the talk um, uh, say bad things about point scanning microscopes compared to light sheet microscopes. And so what we needed to do was combine the adaptive optics with the lattice light sheet. And so we did that. This is an example where we're looking at uh, an intestinal organoid with uh, gene edited um, CRISPR'd in for the um, two markers of uh, the clathrin coated pits. Without the adaptive optics, you can't see the pits at all. With the adaptive optics, you can see the pits very clearly, and you can track them over time and watch their internalization, just as we did in the SIM thing in 2D, but now in a full multicellular 3D organoid in this case. Um, we can then use that to look at organelle dynamics, just as we did with the lattice or the SIM, but now look at it in a multicellular system. Um, obviously, it's very difficult in a system that that's difficult and all packed together with those cells to train your eye to, onto any one event that's going on. But because the resolution is now good enough with a membrane marker, it's pretty easy to computationally segment the cells then. And then you can zoom in <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, over any cell in that field of view and then study the dynamics of, of, the, of the organelles over time. And so, for example, Here's an example where uh, we followed a cell through mitosis, and it did an asymmetric division where it then partitioned the organelles differently in the two different um, daughter cells that appeared. So um, we applied that with Minoru Koyama at Genelia using a version of Brainbow where you can actually do a pulse chase, and by putting on a drug, you only see the newly differentiated neurons. And so what we found is that... Um, the growth cones on the head to tail growing neurons are very tightly confined in the direction of motion, but the ones that are going um, dorsoventrally splay out their growth cones until they get to the tract where the, where the head to tail ones are, and then they do a sharp degree turn and go the other direction. We also found that um, whether they're going dorsoventrally or, um, or uh, um, uh, head to tail, is that as soon as they start to form these axons out of the soma, they immediately make a beeline for the outer surface of the existing uh, neuropil. And so the spinal cord grows from the inside out over time as these things happen. So this is now then looking at a neutrophil again, but not in a collagen mesh or on a cover slip anymore, but in the inner ear of a live zebrafish. The blue particles are dextran particles which are getting scooped up by <coughs> the neutrophil. And they have, they're about twice as, twice as fast in their motion and about twice the surface to volume as they are, say, in the collagen. So they're considerably more dynamic in that native environment. These are the skin cells, the hind cells. You're about to see a fibroblast here. These are the filopodi on the fibroblast. And it's about to go into mitosis in a second. And then there's some blebs there that's going to form there. So, you know, I find biology beautiful, amazing, and incredibly humbling and scary in the thought that there are 37 trillion cells in your body right now doing that dance. And each one of those cells has 2 billion molecules that are kind of doing the kind of dance you see in those S SPT Palm movies. So we really have our work cut out for us to try to understand these systems. It's amazingly complicated. Um, but I view kind of looking at a neutrophil there versus a neutrophil in the collagen meshes. In the one case, I'm look, it's like looking at a lion in a cage with it in the mesh, but I'm looking at it in that ear, and it's like looking at it while it's chasing an antelope on the savanna. They behave a little bit differently. And so, you know, it really, really, I think, the future of, this, of imaging of, of cellular biology to me is looking at cells intravitally or in model organisms where we can still stu study them with high resolution in space and time. A final example with uh, Ben Martin, Dave Mattis from Stony Brook, um, <coughs> working with a xenograph model where we put um, MDA uh, human breast cancer cells injected into a 
a transgenic zebrafish with the vasculature labeled. They wanted to see if, if the um, mechanisms of motility match that of neutrophils, where there's a three-step process of sort of rolling, and you can see that along with these long, sticky microvilli that it trails behind it, and then um, sort of integrin-type uh, motility inside of capillaries, and finally, the extravasation here. Um, and again, it's pretty crazy the morphologies that these cells are able to adopt as they try to work their way through the interstitials of the surrounding cells. So that's pretty much it on, on the biology part. So to me, my, my concerns are twofold going forward, is that there is now such a gulf between the microscopes we have in my lab and the few other labs around the world and the needs and the uh, availability to the rest of the biological community, that this accessibility problem is a big one, is that you know, it doesn't matter how good one microscope is if it's one microscope, because it's too narrow a bottleneck. So we've tried to, you can see how complex these microscopes can be here. And so um, the ultimate answer to this problem is commercialization because only through that kind of product development process can you make a turnkey instrument that's cost effective enough so the biologists can hit the go button and they can focus on their biology and not how to keep the microscope running. And really that's a huge effort in order to do that. But the problem is, is that there's a catch-22 is that companies aren't going to invest tens of millions of dollars in product development if they don't know there's a market and they don't know if there's a market until there's enough applications that have been demonstrated by said microscopes. And so how do we do that? Um, so one way is by trying to disseminate our tech to other groups. And so with the Lattice Light Sheet, we build a second generation instrument that we exhaustively documented, um, and it has very good performance. Over 100 different groups have signed research licenses to get the plans to that. Um, probably 30 instruments that I'm aware of are functional right now out of that group. Also, we sub-licensed that design to a company who makes copies. Another 20 out of those have been sold. Um, but uh, we want to do better than that in our next microscope. So we want to still make it good performance. We want to compact. We want to document it. But we also want to make it easier for people to assemble. We want it to be more optically stable so you don't have to have a, uh, an engineer on hand to keep it, keep it optimum. We want to have it applicable to more samples, and we want to really keep the price down if possible. So that's been a big effort in my group, particularly because after our Lattice with Adaptive Optics paper came out last year, we were with, besieged with people who wanted to try it out and potentially build it themselves. But that microscope fills a 10-foot optical table and costs almost a million bucks and nobody in their right mind would replicate that. So we had to design a next generation, just as we did with the lattice, to make that better. And as we started going through that process, we realized, yeah, there's a lot of stuff here, all right. We have to have a Thai sapphire laser for the guide star. We have to have galvos. We have to have a deformal mirror. We have to have a spatial light modulator. We have to have objectives. But then we started to realize, well, you know, I talked about that Cambrian explosion of new microscope technologies. If you have this set of components, you have the components necessary to do any one of those microscopes over the last 30 years. So what's I, I always say that one microscope can never do it all, but there's no law that says you can't have more than one mic microscope in a box. And so now we've developed what we call the Swiss Army knife, which is uh, a four foot by four foot box it has upright inverted and light sheet workstation, so you can put a mouse on over here. You can put you know, an, uh, an embryo underneath the inverted. You can put cells in your lattice light sheet. Um, it has all these different modes of operation from confocal to airy scan to phase imaging to two photon, the structured illumination, on and on. Every single one of them for multicellular use in, in, uh, through the adaptive optics. Um, we are building the first seven of them right now. They're about a month or so from completion. We're going to release six more to other groups who want them right away. And the total cost is only 60000 more than the original lattice was, or 410 k So we worked really, really hard to get the price down. Um, the problem is, and that's the microscope right now, 
is that while the class of biologists who would like to use these advanced tools is very large, the pool of people who have the skill set to build and maintain these instruments is very small. And the ability to get these two groups together is fairly rare. And so you have a pretty small Venn diagram overlap of skill sets that would allow this to happen. And again, that ultimately has to be overcome by commercialization. But for, to get that demand high enough <coughs> that the companies will bite, you have to have the applications. And so to do that, we developed at Genelia an advanced imaging center, which is only for people outside of Genelia. And it's free of charge to come and use advanced microscopes. Our lattice light sheet there is incredibly oversubscribed. I mean, it runs almost 24 hours a day all the time. And um, we're going, this, this Swiss Army knife that we're building now in my lab is going to be the next instrument we're putting in to that uh, Genelia Institute. So this has been very, very popular, and it's really helped to start putting out some, some uh, papers. But I'm publishing papers now for data that we took with our collaborators five or six years ago because it's taken them that long to even chew into a fraction of the data that they've had. And so the AIC has seen the same thing. And so we need to tackle that problem of, of data analysis biologically inspired. And this really has to be a tight feedback loop. The biologist has to drive it. He's got the question. He has to dictate what we do. And then the imaging guy has to figure out what's the best modality and the best conditions to get the best quality data to the data scientist that's going to give the best results back to the biologist. So all, all three partners have to work co-equally. It's very similar to the model of like the advanced light source at Berkeley, where even during the pre-proposal stage, before you submit anything, you just engage the data scientists and the, and the instrumentation people as a biologist to make your proposal strong to be able to use all of that so you have a good plan in place when you come for your two weeks on the beam line or whatever. So the data science staff is involved in the consultation, and they also help to optimize the acquisition to get the answers the biologists need. So we are starting another imaging center now that I've moved to Berkeley called, instead of the Advanced Imaging Center, the Advanced Bioimaging Center, um, which will be a, there will certainly be, the first two instruments will be the Swiss Army knife two copies of that. And again, it's going to be free of charge for people to come in. But we're going to have way more uh, data scientist people than instrumentation people in this case. And furthermore, we've already established collaborations with Google and CZI and several pharma in the area to help take a lot of the, a lot of the pharma and a lot of the data science people are dying for incredibly rich and large biological data sets just to prove their chops with their machine learning and AI to extract data from that. So we can leverage what we're doing in our own labs um, with, with our own data science people with that help. And so we want to create a whole suite of open source imaging tools that can then be broadly distributed, particularly like at the end of this year, Zeiss is coming out with the commercial version of the Lattice Light Sheet. If that product proves popular, um, there is going to be just a deluge of data, and this problem is just going to be incredibly intense. You know, like the last two papers we did were 200 and 600 terabytes of data. Every week, the AIC lattice is putting out at least 20 terabytes. And so uh, you can imagine 100 lattices around the world running um, are going to very quickly run into big problems. And so with that, I'd like to quit and, uh, and say again, that um, while the tools of the 20th century in biology, the biochemistry, molecular biology, and structural biology have really transformed our understanding of living systems, they are still reductionist um, to the point where they're missing out on the dynamics. And to me, the real story has been, again, because of the ability of the new, of the new technologies we've had, we've been able to create microscopes to see the cell, cellular dynamics with clarity that we could not have imagined 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And these technologies are finally able to allow us 
to understand the findings of molecular biology and biochemistry in the context of the dynamic cell. And I think that's going to change the way we look at living systems in the future. Thank you very much. The exciting things going on. Do you have enough time to sleep? No. <laughs> I also have a one-year-old daughter, so that also impacts the sleep a little bit. So. I see you included, you are still in the discovery phase and having so much fun in the biology. One of the major areas of challenge is the pathologist and the human mind. And uh, you mentioned about some of the synapses. Yes. That is critical, mm -hmm. but it is the poor synaptic density and one of the major complexes. So how many proteins you could measure simultaneously? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, that's a big limitation of fluorescence is we have lots, lots of fluorophores in lots of different colors. What we don't have are good ways in living systems to attach them with high specificity to more than two or three proteins at a time. Now, we can do lots of studies with two or three of this, two or three of that, or, but I have a couple holy grails left in microscopy I don't know how to solve. And one would be able to see, for example, all the proteins in the synapse and in the, and the, and in the spine at the same time, um, or in the endocytic pathway at the same time. So many mysteries would be cleared up by being able to see all the protein partners at once, but we have no way to do it. Thank you. I'd like to invite everybody to the reception, which will be held, uh, I think, in the uh, NIH library, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.